dude, you you're like uh, the Patrick Bates Bateman of uh, of sleep. I love this. Yeah, yeah. Patrick Bateman probably would have worn a whoop. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back to the Eric Anders Lang Show. Very excited to be here today. Uh, mostly thank you to our good friends at Precision Pro. We wouldn't be here without you, an early sponsor of all of the content we create. And it's the original rangefinder of Random Golf Club, Precision Pro Golf. Easily the coolest rangefinder I've ever seen. Okay, the Precision Pro NX10 is the first customizable rangefinder in golf with an interchangeable side plate and front plate. You can now personalize the look of your NX10 to fit your style. And until June 19th, you can go to precisionprogolf.com and save $20 on the new NX10 and see how you can customize your game. Big thank you for taking care of the fam, Precision Pro. Got a really exciting episode today. We're going to talk with... Will Ahmed, obviously, we're going to jump right into that. There's a video on the YouTube channel that I referred to early on. Obviously, Whoop, very involved in, we were able to do a breaking series at the Country Club at Brookline for the U.S. Open. It's such a big deal. Um, that video was only made possible by our two great partners, Whoop and Abercrombie and & Fitch. Thank you, Whoop, for getting us this great interview with Will Ahmed that you are hearing today. He's an interesting individual. I've been a fan of his for a while. I think you can tell that I'm fanning out on this guy. He gave me a ride in his car, and I was like, let's just keep going, man. Like, let's just go to California, dude. It's me and you. He's a little busy. Anyway, he couldn't do that. But Abercrombie's got a new collection coming out. It's called The Golf Shop. It's at Abercrombie.com. And I will say, I have a lot of the pieces. Some of them are like really nice kind of like cotton pieces that you would wear on like, you know, a tweener weather, if you will, kind of like high 60s, low 70s. And you just want to get out there and look like, oh, I don't know, JFK. Um, the other stuff is a little bit more fit, fabric, flexible, athletic guy stuff, you know. Um, they've got chinos with some flex. They got rugby polos, quarter zips, all day shorts, and more. So to get dressed for success, go to Abercrombie.com and use this code RGCAF. It sounds like it stands for RGC as fuck, but really it stands for Random Golf Club Abercrombie Fitch. And at Abercrombie.com, you're going to get 20% off all men's products, excluding all the clearances and fragrances. Obviously, guys, don't try to scam the deal. And ultimately, you already smell great. It's valid starting today through the 29th. Really excited for you to check out what Abercrombie has in store for you and for you on the golf course, most importantly. Back to the show. Are you hearing the music then? This is a good distance. What, what distance do you want me? Uh, you know, whatever you're comfortable, just maintain. Just stay there. We're looking for consistency, Will. <laughs> a, that'll be an, that'll be an that's important a, thing That's a today. theme in your life. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you... Uh, what I ask people this in a lot of different ways. People sometimes I say, "How do you describe what you do to people when you meet them for the first time?" But I'm curious to know from you, when did you first describe to your parents what Whoop is or was going to be, and and how did you do that? Yeah, that's going back in time. So this would have been October, like roughly October of 2011, which was my senior year at Harvard. And I had just spent the previous two years convincing myself that I was capable of starting a company. And I didn't even really fully know what that meant to start a company. But I remember uh, writing this like long email to my parents explaining why I wasn't going to take a job offer to like work in finance and why I wanted to start start this business. And uh and it was totally a leap, you know, it's it was it was uh, an uncomfortable feeling, I remember. Uh, committing to uh, starting something that I didn't even really fully understand. You know, what, what does it mean to start a business? But I was very passionate at the time about human physiology and being able to continuously measure the human body and performance. And and I'd done all of this research in school and it had gotten to the point where it was really the only thing I was thinking about. And in many ways, uh, the company was going to get started one way or another, you know, it just, it felt like I was getting pulled into it and I was figuring out what it meant to be an entrepreneur before I even knew what an entrepreneur was. So the mission is to unlock human potential, right? That's going back as far as you can in time. You know, we're talking about athletes and sport in a lot of ways. Like that's kind of a lot of who you cater to and who you help. 
when did you first become fascinated with that person, the athlete? Well, I was always into sports and exercise growing up. I probably played 10 sports by the age of 15 or so. And, and I ended up playing squash uh, competitively when I was in college. I was captain of the Harvard squash team. And the experience of being a college athlete showed me just how little you actually knew about your, your body as an athlete training. And, you know, many athletes overtrain, they undertrain, they misinterpret fitness peaks, they get injured. Uh, how does sleep fit into the equation? How does recovery fit into the equation? I personally was somebody who used to overtrain, which is kind of the ultimate betrayal because you're pushing yourself more and more and more. And then all of a sudden you fall off a cliff. Yeah. And you're like, it's kind of this, like the mantra of like, I'm working hard. Results will follow. Right. It's a more is more, uh, <laughs> mindset. And I would say in 2010, 2012, that time frame, we kind of reached peak of more is more from an athletic training standpoint. You know, these things are a little bit of pendulums. Well, when you say we, you mean like society? Or? Society, sports, uh, you know, you look back and you were kind of coming just out of this steroid era. There was a lot of performance enhancing drugs. People were seeing if they could work out three times a day instead of two times a day. It was it, it just reached a real extreme. Well, and if, do you know why? I'm, now I'm kind of curious, like backing up, because I know what you're talking about. Well, I I don't necessarily know why that had happened, uh, but my hunch in doing all this research, my belief was that the missing piece of the equation was recovery. And the reason that I overtrained as an athlete wasn't necessarily just because of what I did for three hours at practice, but it was all the things I did or didn't do for the other 21 hours of the day. Right. So how are you treating your body when you're not exercising? How do you think about sleep? How do you think about recovery? How do you think about diet? How do you think about substances? As a college athlete, I was probably on the wrong side of a lot of that. But more broadly, I also realized it was a blind spot for athletes in general. Yeah. And so... That's why the initial market for Whoop was athletes, and uh, we can talk more about that. Today, Whoop works with actually a really wide-ranging consumer, but the origin was, let's go after the best athletes in the world. Well, yeah, I mean, to, to like underscore that point, like I wouldn't consider myself an athlete, but I benefit greatly from you know what it kind of gives me, and I guess I could just... I was I meant to ask you today. So we played golf today, and that was a, that was a fun. lot of fun. A lot of fun. We, uh, you, you're an athlete. You are an athlete, right? Yeah, yeah. You're. An, I'm not an athlete, but you're an athlete. And you, well, like, you outdrove me with the three wood, which you know was like I I had to stop watching at some point. Like I had to like look away. But um, I, I meant to ask you on the golf course. Do, do you do you like have a book that you go to? You know what I mean? Or do you do you, do you have like because because the reason why. I, I told you I was reading Atomic Habits. Sure. And there seems to be a large parallel for me in, you know, the whoop strap and the, and the, and the, you know, the, the information that I get when I open up the app, similar to Atomic Habits. Like, it's just like, basically once I see these things happening, I'm like, oh, well, this is because of that. And so all I need to do is change this. And it's not even that big of a deal. It, it creates like an inspiration for me to change the way I'm doing what I'm doing so that I can be better at really not a sport, but just kind of like for the hours that I'm awake during the day, just like happier. And do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, so that book was really interesting for me to pair the two together. And I was wondering if there's a book that you like go to for that. I think there's less, it's less specifically um, books and it's more just thinking broadly about behavior change. You know, when you try to zero in exactly on, what is it that makes Whoop different from other wearables that have come before us? What has made Whoop more successful? The biggest difference in our value proposition is that if you've been on Whoop for, call it over six months, you've changed your behavior and you've improved your health. Yeah. So at its core, that's what we're able to do. We're able to change behavior and improve health uh, through technology. And... A lot of that comes back to this ability to manage what you measure. A lot of that comes back to the way that Whoop simplifies data and makes it digestible. We think about data in layers, which is a, another important theme. So like the paper I wrote in 2011 was titled The Feedback Tool, Measuring Intensity, Recovery, and Sleep. And today, you know, 10 years later, the, th the three main things that we measure are strain, recovery, and sleep. 
and it's still there yeah do you look back i'm sorry but do you look back on that you were 21 yeah i wrote that when i was 21 do you look back on that and you're like holy shit i was right well it's i mean sure it's it's certainly rewarding to (laughs) to see it play out but then it also i think there comes a moment when you see something that you've created or you've worked really hard with a with a brilliant team to create where you then ask yourself, well, what else can you create, right? right. So it, in a way, it compounds on itself positively. Um, obviously, I'm incredibly grateful that I saw that in that moment and it's played out. But um, I think more more broadly is how you take that going forward. It's like now that we've built this platform and this established user base and these passionate people who use our technology every day, how can we get it on more and more people? How can we have a bigger impact? How can you go from improving people's sleep and telling them that they're sick to saving lives? Yeah. You know, that's the potential of health monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. I remember for those who like weren't clued in and I shared this with you already, but like when COVID hit as a whoop user, you unveiled the ability to track respiratory rate. Was that already available or that was a new feature right then? Right. So or you highlighted we, it. Maybe. We talked about a theme earlier today, like this idea of your your sort of core DNA when you start a company or a business, then carrying the company through. And one of our core sort of core aspects of our DNA was that we we worked to move really quickly, and we grounded everything we did in research. Uh, in starting the company, I found it disappointing just how slow research institutions operated yeah you know they weren't operating i thought at at the appropriate cadence and so i vowed that we as an organization at whoop would push that envelope and try to do research really fast okay fast forward to january of 2020 one of our board members um was uh, you know kind of that one key executive call it at uh, facebook and both uber uh for growth And so he was used to seeing how small numbers become really big numbers. And he essentially told me in January that COVID-19 was going to be this global pandemic. So maybe we were clued into it six weeks or eight weeks earlier than other folks. But I took that and I said, okay, well, if that's that ends up being true, we're going to want to measure as much as we can about this thing to try to understand it. If the whole world's going to get a virus, we want to know what it does to your body. And we were the first consumer app in March of 2020 to come out with COVID-19 tracking. So right around when society was just waking up to the fact that this was going to be a, a virus or a global pandemic, we had actually already introduced tracking in the app. And by the end of March of 2020, we had 2,000 people report testing positive for COVID-19. I mean, I appreciate that. That's a pretty large data set at a time when people were just trying to figure out what the coronavirus was. Oh, and there was like vaccine passports were still a year away and those were already going to be a mess anyway. So we were able to then quickly partner with leading research institutions around the world to look at that data and understand what does COVID-19 look like physiologically before, during, and after on your body. And fast forward to June, we found you know what you might call a smoking gun. And that was respiratory rate, which is something that WHOOP measures, uh, having, you know, 20 to 30 percent elevation when someone gets COVID. And this would occur in about 80 percent of cases. So essentially 80 percent of the time WHOOP could catch that someone had COVID, right? 80 percent is not perfect, but that's a hell of a lot better than nothing, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so we started getting these messages from people. Uh, about their respiratory rate and them noticing that it had gone up so much and then them using that as a reason to stay home or not go to work or get right. tested. And, and just be preemptive. Yeah. And sure enough, it was then published in you know, peer-reviewed medical journals. And so respiratory rate, you're basically saying like, I think my average was like 12. It's 12 breaths per minute. Correct. And you're saying if it goes up to 17, you, you may have COVID. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's similar. Yeah. It's, it's either COVID or you're, you were just at altitude or you already have some kind of asthma, but it, there's like a very small set of things. And what's right. also powerful is if you look at a bunch of other physiological metrics, so let's say resting heart rate, heart rate variability, um, your sleep, right? When you get a cold or you get the flu or you get COVID-19, all of those things look similarly. 
your resting heart rate's really elevated. Right. Your heart rate variability is really low. Your sleep's all disturbed, right? right? But when you get COVID and only COVID, does your respiratory rate spike? Interesting. So if you look at the flu and COVID next to each other, the biggest difference will be this huge spike in respiratory Because it's rate. a respiratory yeah, yeah, virus. Yeah, because it's a lower respiratory tract infection. That's so. It's almost like it, you must sort of like lie awake at night and be like, we're measuring stuff and we don't even know why yet. Like th there's probably something else out there in 10, 20, 30 years that you're like, we'll be, we're ready. Well, I think it's going to be more like 10 or 20, you know, months, right? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, this stuff's yeah. happening really fast. Yeah. And um, I think people really underestimate the potential of this technology. So I didn't even know a lot of like what you just shared about for the last couple of minutes. My experience was, you know, you were like respiratory rate, check it out. And I was like, oh, okay. So I'm like, you know, watching my respiratory rate. And I remember for me as like a, as like a consumer, right? Like, just being like, okay, like my respiratory rate's okay. And I actually used it as a way to kind of be like, to almost psychologically soothe what was a really difficult time for a lot of people. And then this was also the time when you guys got really involved with the PGA Tour, right? And you partnered with them as a way of kind of similarly modeling out the same, um, you know, benefits, right? Is well, it was it was kind of a wild story. You know, Nick Watney had been on Whoop for about a year. Nick Watney, professional golfer. The PGA Tour is now back. They were the first, uh, sorry, this is like June of 2020. Yeah. Um, Jay Monahan, to his credit, commissioner, said, hey, we're coming back. They were the first sport to come back. Yeah. No Picture fans. Yeah. Globally, first sport to come back. So they were figuring it out first. And Nick Watney uh, had been a longtime whoop wearer, had read all of our research about COVID. The protocol was you'd get tested for COVID on a Tuesday. If you tested negative, you could then play through the week. Nick Watney tested negative on a Tuesday. He wakes up on Thursday, the day of the tournament, and he has this dramatically elevated respiratory rate. He's got a really low recovery. And he goes to the doctors and he says, hey, I've got this elevated respiratory rate on my whoop. I think I should get tested again. And you can imagine they said, well, what is whoop and this and that. But, <laughs> you know, anyway, uh, they he twisted their arm and they gave him another test. And sure enough, it came back positive. Whoa. And so he was able to drop out of the tournament and uh, as a consequence, not give it to maybe a, a whole host of players. Right. At a time when it was it was probably at, at its most potent. So. Uh, we get a call then from the PGA Tour about 24 hours later saying, hey, we need a thousand of these. I love it. For every, not just every player, but to their credit, every player, caddy, media member, staff member in the, in the bubble. In the bubble. And, uh, and so I'll never forget going with this team of like five whoop people into, it was the Travelers, which was yeah. the tournament the next week. And just onboarding every professional golfer and caddy. And it was kind of a trip because it's like you're joining a country club with the best golfers in the world. There was no one else there. I remember I remember following you on Instagram at that point. And that was when it was like, because we had already been working together before COVID. And so it was really interesting to kind of like be like, you know, aware of the backstory of Whoop before all this. And like, and just I remember there was, I remember that picture of you inside the ropes and you were like, I, I can't believe what's happening. Yeah, it, it's it almost like the, the it's almost like you've done so much background work and then the lights went on and you were like, we're ready. Yeah, I think that that's a good way to look at it. Um, a lot of the whoop story has been it takes a really long time to get pretty successful overnight. Yeah. You know, after so been building the business for 10 years after seven years, it almost went bankrupt. After 10 years, it, it's been valued at three point six billion dollars. I right, picture that different than bankrupt. Yeah. Very different. Yeah, picture that, you know. <laughs> and so when I meet with entrepreneurs or um, aspiring entrepreneurs, one of the, the key things I talk about is just to keep going. Like you just got to keep going. And I think that's a it's a it's a critical component to success is just to be relentless about what you're trying to build and recognize that you're going to have all kinds of challenges. But then when the moment happens and you you do have that opportunity to take it. I didn't know about 
I, I think a lot of people ask me, they're like, oh, what were the hard times? Like, tell me about the hard times. I don't know why people are interested in that. Well, you're a compelling figure. I know. I thank you. I try. I, well, I don't try. Maybe I, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I should try more. But um, I, I think the idea of, um, you know, I've shared on my podcast, right? This podcast that we've, I've gone through some tough times rather recently. And I, I found that I've really found more value and learning and almost like even inspiration and traction around that and on the tail of that. And so like, it's kind of shocking for me to hear that you guys had a difficult time at one point, you said almost going bankrupt. Like what was the teaching there? Well, it's funny if, if the company hadn't worked out, I probably would have gotten a lot of the wrong learnings from it. Mm. You know, I would have looked back on it as being too ambitious. I would have looked back on it as I should have found a way to make more money faster. I should have um, had a less, amb you know, sort of less people, less wide vision, more focused uh, and and burned less cash. Because at the end of the day, for a startup, your runway is sort of how much cash you have in the bank and how much you spend. And we had, we had gone through lots of money at that point. But having come out through it, right, and overcome that moment. And every company, I think, has a moment where they need to figure a few things out to get to the other side. What I learned from it is that you can have a really a really strong vision and you can be quite ambitious, but you do have to get through those stages. Yeah. Like... Uh, you, you have to persist. And so, you know, we were fortunate to have great capital partners who came through in the end. And um, and then we ultimately created a business model that's been enormously so successful. Like, how close did you get? Days. Days. <laughs> like you were days away from being like, I can't pay anyone in this room. It, it was, yeah, it got pretty gnarly. Wow. All right, so this is the week, obviously, we're focused on playing good golf, not only on the YouTube channel for Random Golf Club Films, but also because there's a major going on. It's the third major of the year, the U.S. Open, and you can download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the code EALSHOW at sign up, and when you deposit $25 or more, you're going to get $100 in free bets instantly, which it would sound like they're just giving you $100. I'm not going to get into what's actually happening here, but if you use the code EAL show, you're going to go figure it out only at DraftKings Sportsbook. There is a minimum age and eligibility restrictions do apply. Luckily, being good at golf is not one of those. So see the show notes for details, folks. Get into DraftKings.com. Download the Sportsbook app now. Use code EAL show at sign up. Deposit $25 or more and get $100,000 no, $100 in free bets instantly. The code is EAL show at DraftKings Sportsbook. I have a message for everyone about a green powder. Is that a veiled way of talking about athletic greens, which I love? I got to tell you, I was a customer first, and now they've brought me in to do some amazing ad reads. The main thing about athletic greens is that it's lifestyle friendly, okay? So whether you, literally you could be on any effing diet and you can eat this stuff gluten-free dairy-free vegan paleo keto your dog actually i don't know if your dog can eat it and the main thing i love about it is that it's a micro habit for those of you that can't understand what i'm saying it's a small habit that changes the way you live your life you do it every single day it's a way of taking care of yourself it's easy okay and it's going to be even easier to get into this stuff when you get your free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin D, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash EAL show. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash EAL show to take ownership over your health and to pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So just scoop in a cup of water every day and a thing of athletic greens, and uh, you're going to avoid taking a bunch of annoying pills. Athleticgreens.com slash EAL show. Get it in your dish. I think one of the interesting things that I really feel like you guys have done really well is choosing who you work with. And by that, I mean the athletes that you work with. And we were talking a little bit after golf, and you said you were open to talking about this on the podcast, which kind of surprised me. 
but a lot of your ambassadors are actually investors. Yeah, that's right. I mean, if we go back in time for a second, the reason we started with professional athletes was twofold. One, it was that I thought that professional athletes needed to understand sleep and recovery the most because they were getting paid tens of millions of dollars to recover in order to play well. And they didn't measure it. And the second was that if the world's best athletes authentically wore the product, by authentically, I mean they got value out of it, right? It could create a brand halo to help us cascade into the consumer market. Part of the reason I thought branding was going to be important was if you looked at health monitoring historically, it was definitively not cool. You know, if someone's wearing a health monitor, it's like there's something wrong with you. Yeah, it doesn't look like this. No, well, let alone how it looks even, but it's it's a signal that there's something oh. wrong with you. Oh, he's wearing a health monitor. Something's wrong with him, right? Interesting. Whereas, uh, you know, I grew up inspired by brands like Nike. You know, you you put on a, a pair of Jordans with a swoosh on it and like you feel good. You know, there's something positive that goes with that. So if you compare where health monitors were were to what the world's best brands were able to do in terms of how they make you feel, I thought it'd be important, right? I thought it'd be important to create that aspirational association with the product. Um, but the, the execution of that turned out to be very hard because we had to be incredibly stubborn about athletes paying for the product and using the product because they were going to get value out of it. And it also held a very high bar for us. It's kind of bold. It held a very high bar for us because it meant that if they were wearing it, they were getting value out of it. Yeah. And the way I felt was there was no amount of money we could pay someone to wear something 24-7 if they weren't going to get value out of it. Right. And we kind of saw that play out with brands like Under Armour, Nike, Adidas. People forget they had big wearable plays. Nike had a fuel band. Yeah, you didn't see LeBron wearing it. Yeah. Why not? It just didn't do it for him. Because it didn't give him value. So that that was where that stubbornness came from. And then what it led to was us developing a really powerful product, having really high professional athletes, high performing professional athletes buy the product, use the product, and get value out of it. And then us finding the ones who really liked it. And so if you look at the the athletes who have invested in the company and who um, from time to time will promote the product or who we may use in advertising. they are people who, if we didn't have formal relationships with, they'd still be wearing it. And so to me, that's the ultimate sign of authenticity. We didn't want to go out and find people to pay to wear it. We wanted to find the people who are already wearing it, who had a great story and then amplify it. Yeah. That's like way easier. Did you, I mean, did you, it sounds like such a revolutionary idea. Did it just, how did you, how did that like arise? I think it comes back from the simple fact that it's really, really, really hard to get someone to wear something 24 seven. Yeah. And so I just didn't think that paying people to do that or giving them equity to do that was a good strategy. First of all, it doesn't scale at all. And so interesting. And it doesn't also prove that you have a great product. Did people tell you that that plan wasn't going to work? Oh yeah, that was, I feel like a, I would tell you that, and I it would was be a wrong. huge it was a huge point of contention with with many investors and industry experts because two of our first hundred users were people like literally LeBron James and Michael Phelps, and so in 2014 15 we were talking about hey should we go out and essentially sign these guys as, uh, you know, give them equity in the company and this and that. The other reason I didn't want to do that is when you're at that um, small of a stage, it becomes all of a sudden the LeBron wearable right. or the Phelps wearable or whatever. And then you don't even have an identity as a company. Yeah. So, so we weren't even big enough, in my opinion, to have that kind of a relationship. Okay, so it was only until years later that I felt that was appropriate. Right. So speaking about company identity, you know, I'm 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 sitting here in Boston yeah. at the headquarters, and I've I've like I said, I've been a customer for a long time, right? I've I've, I've used the app, I follow the Instagram, I get the emails. I'm sitting here. There's a sign behind you that says Whoop. It's probably in that camera angle there. I could see it. It's really beautiful. It's like kind of making me feel something all of a sudden. I'm realizing, and I'm like, when did you first hear that word? 
Whoop. Yeah. That was a word that we would say in college, uh, like a bunch of my friends would say it sort of to express energy or excitement. So it'd be like, Hey, how you feeling? Like you got whoop for the match or you going out tonight? You got whoop. And, and so it was this word that made people smile. It was also a word that when other people heard, they would start to say, which I thought was things a good sign for a word or anything. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and I thought, you know, what, what, what's a better word to start a brand than something that makes you smile and expresses energy. Yeah. It's so funny because like, I feel, I feel kind of like if someone asked me early on, like, okay, I'm going to start a thing. It's going to be a search engine and we're going to call it Google. I'd be like terrible. <laughs> and it's funny. Cause when I first like heard about the brand whoop, I was always like, what is that? But now I don't question it right now. It's like, Oh yeah, it's a whoop strap. Like you don't know what it is. It's a whoop. Like, it's just, like if you don't know what it is, like something's wrong with you. I think that that's, probably common for a lot of good sounding brands after the fact and it goes back to why the early stages are so hard yeah because everyone's questioning it and stuff yeah like whoop sounds like a bit of a weird name <laughs> and when when no one knows what it is you know it sounds like a really cool name when a lot of people know what it is right so there's there's that there's that tension in so many things about being an early stage company or being an early stage entrepreneur you have to accept feeling uncomfortable a lot yeah you have to get you get rejected a lot okay so you're so this is like we're in the app okay i'm looking at today had a good recovery 84 percent. that's pretty good and Ten, so what what uh, is your sleep seven and a half hours you go to bed 11 30 to 9 30 that's nice yeah Wait, that, that right? that's my that's my like saturday night into sunday routine like sleeping okay cool cool really pile up the hours if we go into the week dude your recovery scores are bonkers. Yeah, they're all green. Thursday, you had a 88. That's pretty high. Have you ever had a 100? So I don't think you can get 100. I'm <laughs> you would almost, know, dude. <laughs> I'm almost certain you can't get 100. Scott, can you check if anyone's ever had 100? This this tends to be a typical week for me where okay, it's so just is, laddering up. Yeah, so strain, you're basically pushing. This is, this is sleep. Oh, this is sleep. So okay. over the course of the week, I'm getting more and more sleep. Interesting. Why, why is that like a, is that like a, do you format it that way? Just, I think sometimes the earlier, you know, the earlier days in the week are a little bit more intense or okay. maybe a little less optimized. Yeah. Monday's intense. Yeah. Monday's definitely intense. On on average, I'm getting about seven hours of sleep. Okay. On average, I'm spending wow, wait, about eight like, hours in bed. You have a seriously rigorous, like re sleep routine. Do you, are you like really intense about like, I need to be in bed by midnight? Uh, I try to go to bed at, at roughly the same time every, every, yeah, I mean, that's uh, what you ask other people to do with the app. Yeah. It's called sleep <laughs> consistency. I, you know, I buy it, you know, I buy into a lot of that, but there, there must be a part, isn't there a part of you that's just like, ah, I just, I just don't want to do it. Well, I like feeling good. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah, fair enough. I like being kind of dialed in if I can be right. Uh, so my sleep routine is I wear these, these blue light blocking glasses before bed. Yeah. They're pretty goofy, you know, red, red tint. Your wife makes fun of you. She makes fun of me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, but they naturally make you sleepy. And so if you're someone who's on your phone late into the night or you're looking at a screen or you're watching TV, the blue light that's emitting from those screens is telling your brain to stay awake. And so it affects your sleep, especially the, for the first, call it third of your sleep. And so by wearing these glasses, it allows me to be on my phone. It allows me to work, whatever. So that's one huge key. Another is that uh, the bedroom is really cold. Yes. Like 65, 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, really dark. I'll often wear an eye mask. I take a little bit of magnesium and melatonin. Oh, wow. dude, you, you're like, uh, the Patrick Bates Bateman of, uh, of sleep. I love this. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick Bateman probably would have worn a whoop. <laughs> uh, but I feel like Christian Bale probably does. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then I try to go to bed and wake up at fairly similar times. You, you talked a little bit about, um, earlier today, I'm kind of like taking our like round of golf kind of conversations and recycling them a little bit, but you talked a little bit about how meditation has made its way into your life. And I think, you know, for me, that's how I got into this whole thing, right? Is I, I saw golfers using meditation to get better at the pro level. 
that question kind of got me through some rabbit holes to where we are today. And in some sense, it seems like Whoop has the ability to further prove that to people that might be curious or unsure that that's true, that, that meditation can improve your ability on the golf course or in general. Well, well there's no question that uh, learning how to breathe properly enhances a lot of your physiology. So, you know, lowers your resting heart rate, increases your heart rate variability, will improve your sleep quality. Uh, so I think breathing in general is a very underrated or it's not talked about enough as a component to wellness. You know, most people are focused on exercise or diet. You never hear people really talking about breathing. Uh, so I'm a big believer in breathing. I also am a big believer in meditating. And I learned transcendental meditation in 2014. Uh, I took a four day course because I had kind of, I got into a place in my life where I felt like I didn't, I wasn't doing a good job as CEO or as an entrepreneur. I was strung out. I had raised at that point tens of millions of dollars, which felt like an enormous amount of money. Uh, I had maybe 20 or 25 employees at that time, which also felt like an enormous responsibility. And uh, it just kind of came to a tilt. I had a panic attack. I was, I was just totally out of whack. And so I learned how to meditate and I, I literally have done it every single day since like, you know, we're going on eight plus years now. So it, it was something I became hooked on and, uh, and changed my life for, for the better. And I think what's powerful about meditating is, uh, it gives you an opportunity to review your own thoughts and to sit with them and sort them. And, uh, the more time I've, I've spent doing it over the years, the more I've, I've used it as a tool to, um, not just calm myself, but really try to understand what's going on. Yeah. There's a lot of people look at meditation, right? There's like the like meditation for performance, but then there's also the meditation kind of with the like, I was thinking about my dad. I told you my dad's a physicist. I, I want to know the, there's like well, a little well, sprinkling of salt that was this, coming there. This is like atoms. Okay. And the idea that like a, a physicist would look at the world and they would say that there's nothing different between me and you, yeah. scientifically speaking, right? That the atomically speaking, there's no difference between your atoms and my atoms and we're all one. And so I'm curious to know if your meditation experience did open any of that up for you, because for me, golf did that. G golf was one of the things in my life that became a spiritual practice where I was like, oh, I'm alone out here and I get to choose how I respond. I get to choose what this is for. And so I'm going to make this game meaningful to me. It's obviously turned into a job and it's changed a little bit, sure. but I can still do that for other people. And that's my goal now. Yeah, that's cool. I like the way you put that. I think that, I mean, learning how to meditate just made me much more aware of, it's made me much more aware of my own uh, relationship with other people in the world and not just in the moment that you're meditating, but on a very real time basis, you know, it used to be when I got angry, I'd realize well after the fact I had been angry. Right. You know, whereas now it almost feels like there's someone looking at me in the third person who's going to say, Hey, you're about to get angry or Will's about to get angry before it happens. And the, maybe the right way to describe that is being much more thoughtful, but, um, that that is a really i think powerful tool yeah it, it's been super interesting so i've been like for the past few months i've been on kind of like a awareness kick like self-awareness kick to further that and it's been interesting for me to look at um r really trying to develop the the bridge between like my brain and my body and a lot of that exists here right a lot of that tells me like when i think positive thoughts when i'm when i'm taking positive actions there's a there's a way to measure like i know that when i get good recovery i'm probably not going to be snapping at somebody the next day for like something stupid but what's been really interesting for me is looking at like this idea that and we're going way off topic here but this idea that like w whatever someone else is going through a lot of times at work for me and, and probably the same for you, but like, you know, what, whatever someone else is going through that might be like causing you some type of reaction or me some type of reaction. It's been interesting for me to watch that and be like, that has nothing to do with me. 
And if I react, I'm only going to make it worse. So how can I just kind of be chill and receive whatever's happening in a helpful way? Has that leadership stuff, has that come up for you? Well, I think there's a big theme uh, in leadership or running a business, which is control what you can control. And that kind of reminds me of what you were just saying. I mean, there, there's so many things that are really out of your control, especially in building a business, uh, that you have to be singularly focused on the things that you're influencing and can influence. And that goes a little bit back to focus, which was a theme that we talked about earlier. But I find that many unforced errors in building a business come from a lack of focus or a moment where you're trying to control something that that's out of your control. Right. So that, that that's, that's probably what came to mind first for me as you were, as you were talking about that. Yeah. It's kind of like uh acceptance almost. Yeah. What, what do you have to accept today with, with business? Well, like a painful acceptance over the last seven, seven months was supply chain stuff. So, you know, we launched this new whoop Four. everyone was really excited about it right when it came out. And because of supply chain issues, it took us a while to be able to make them and get caught up to our demand. Now, fortunately, if you order one today, you'll get it in the next few days. But for about seven months there, that wasn't the case. And it was an incredibly painful thing that was largely out of my control. Did that impact so, your recovery scores and stuff? Like, like legit question, you know? It, for for a while, it, it it just made me feel like I was carrying more weight. You know what I mean? It's like it's like running with a vest on. Mm. It's just everything feels a little harder. The whole, and I think in many ways that was the right that's the right analogy for the business too, because when you have a backlog of product, you know, your marketing becomes less efficient or your, uh, your overall sales engine can be slower. Like there's just, there's consequences to that across the whole business. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that puts a stress on, on running the thing, but you also realize then coming out of it, uh, that that was just one of those things that was out of your control. You know, for some businesses, COVID was a big thing that was out of their control. Imagine running a hotel business when COVID hits, right? That's a great example of when you need to take acceptance. Yeah. You may have heard me talk about my friend, Adam Gilbert. Okay. One thing he said to me in confidence. Okay. No one knows he said this, except it is in the podcast ad read copy, but it does say in health and fitness, knowledge isn't the problem. Everyone knows what to do where people struggle is sticking to their plan consistently. Consistency is the key to results. Adam Gilbert, famous founder of my body tutor. Okay. No one needs another book, pill, superfood, or fad diet to be consistent. All you need is someone to walk you through the trenches with you. Okay. And so my body tutor actually does that with you. And Adam is so confident that his plan can help you. He's going to offer you, listeners of the EAL show, $50 off their first fucking month. So to save $50, all you have to do is go to mybodytutor.com, join and mention the Eric Anders Lang Show when they ask you how you heard about them. So if you have any questions, surprisingly, Adam wants you to call or text him. It's kind of intense, but ultimately you can find his personal cell phone number at the top of every page on mybodytutor.com since 2007. Their daily accountability and one-on-one -on -one coaching has been the most effective way to get and stay healthy and fit. One of the problems that I find for me personally is I don't like trying to plan through the whole week. And so I found a really easy way to get out of all of that time that you can basically get back. It's a company called Factor, and basically what they do is they offer 30 different meals per week where you can choose from a variety. Each meal is chef crafted, okay? And it comes straight to the doorstep. And the coolest thing about these chefs is you know what they're not open to doing with their hard crafted work is freezing it. So this meal is always gonna be prepared delicious. You wouldn't even believe that it's good for you. The truth is though, because you guys know, I'm, I'm kind of like, I've been on a bit of a trip. I run around, I come back. 
I actually really enjoy having Factor in the fridge when I get home. It's super delicious. And honestly, I have passed it off as food that I've cooked only to friends, not on dates. Don't worry. Anyway, go to Factor75.com slash EAL show 120. It's a mouthful. Pull over. Get your pen out. It's Factor 75. Think about it. Factor 75. I don't know where the 75 comes in, but you all know that that's three over par. You can do this. Thank you, Factor, for supporting the podcast. So, per, and I told Scott this the other day, and he was like, "That's interesting." He might have been lying to me, but um, <laughs> but basically, I was like, I started, I started to hit a point with Whoop where I was like, "Oh fuck, dude!" Like, I'm on the road. Like, we're out for like six weeks at a time, and you know when we go to bed, we don't know midnight. You know when we wake up, four a.m. You know what I mean? And it's just like the recovery score was so low that I was just like, "This is depressing. This is starting to hurt my feelings." I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing my job. And I was wondering about like, cause you know, pro golfers are like psychos, right? Like they clip their fingernails the same day every week. You know what I mean? They're, they're like, so do they ever, are they ever like, uh, I'd like to not, you know, cause also what's funny too is like sometimes I'll have a low score, but that has no dictation on how I perform or behave. You know what I mean? Like, and so I'm just saying like those numbers are valuable, but sometimes they throw me off. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I think, I think the wrong way to think about whoop is that, you need to have high scores every day. Boom. Well, there you go. You know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, everyone goes through periods of time where you've got low recoveries and high recoveries. And uh, I, I, again, back to what we just talked about with acceptance. I think whoop is a tool, much like other tools, and you have to learn how to use the tool. Uh, Scott McCarron, a good, very good golfer. Uh, but he was someone who talked to me in great detail about just how he would handle his body differently on certain days when his body was run down. So it wasn't like, oh, woe is me. I'm run down. I'm not going to play well. It was for him. I'm going to spend more time driving to the golf course. Yeah. Like I'm, gonna, it's, I'm just going to drive slower. You know, that's kind of chill. I like that. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to hit a few less balls, you know, like, Whoa. I'm, you know, I'm going to breathe a little more. So that, that for him was how he would think about his body being run down. And I think there's a really good lesson in that, you know, it's like, sure. There's some days you have to perform and your body's run down, yeah. but you're going to go with it. You know, it's funny is it went, since you say, this is really interesting that you say that. Cause I look at this past week where I've been yellow every day, but I haven't been red. That's a win too. Right. You know what I mean? Like I'm like yeah. no greens. Then I'm like, well also no reds. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite things uh, used to be when I would take like brutal trips, mm. you know, you, uh, I go to Dubai fairly often and that's kind of a gnarly one just from a time zone standpoint. And it, it would just be, see if I can not be in the red, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and jet lag is such a big part of the golfer's life. Yeah. I, there's a bunch of reasons why whoop exploded on the PGA tour. One reason is that it was a totally overlooked aspect for golfers. Mm. And I'll go so far as to say that I think professional golfers, because there's so, there for a little while there, I'd say less so today, but there was a bit of a stigma that they're not professional athletes the way like a football player is a professional athlete. And, in so, and so they almost overcompensated by doing so much. Yeah. You know, so much lifting, so many times hitting balls, you know, go play the course. And you realize looking at data, they're putting stress on their bodies like 12, 15 hours a day. And then they're doing the jet lag and then they're having a few drinks and whatever. Right. So there was just an enormous load on these guys and they weren't appreciating necessarily the benefit they could get from more sleep or more recovery and less exercise or less playing. Right. And so that was one way that Whoop really slotted itself in was to, to kind of introduce a whole new concept to golfers. The other thing that's super underappreciated about golf and specifically professional golf is how collaborative culturally it is. Yeah. Whoop did not spread like rapid fire within tennis as fast as it grew within golf. Interesting. Why is that? Well, Nadal and Federer, after a match, aren't sharing each other's secrets. They're not saying, hey, have you tried this new melatonin? <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, golf, the players are very much like that. 
you know, Justin Thomas got on whoop because Rory McIlroy said, "Hey, you have to try this. This right. is making me play better." Well, because they're not playing each other; they're playing. They have the they have the same. They have a common enemy. Yeah. So their mindset is they're playing the course is or crazy. they're playing themselves. Yeah. But they're not playing each other, and in a way that makes them much more collaborative. So you know, when I was in the in the bubble with these guys during uh, the COVID stuff, you know, you'd be sitting at a. a a lunch table and they would take out their phones, be showing each other their data. You <laughs> know, you and I was like, kind of, I was kind of blown away by that. Cause I would have thought they would have been a little bit more oh. closed off about these things. And yet it was, it was almost like an open book. Well, also they're probably, I mean, they're, they have only a handful of people around them at, at the highest level. So even at the middle level, it's like, I've heard that life on tour can be relatively lonely and boring actually, which is solely counter to what we would expect from our normal lives. But yeah, that, that connection point must be really interesting for them. Yeah. Um, earlier, we, we were, you were telling me a story about how Gary Player, before the Masters, um, went out and, and, and sat down in front of the scoreboard and visualized his own name winning on the scoreboard for up to an hour, basically meditating. Why did you tell me that story? I think we were talking about visualization or meditation. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of professional golfers. I've also gotten to meet a lot of athletes, you know, across a bunch of different sports. And it does seem to be one recurring theme for the very successful ones or, or ones who are going through periods of great success where they get deeply focused on visualization. And, uh, and I've even had athletes on, on the whoop podcast say like, yeah, you know, I stopped breathing for like a little while or I stopped doing those visualization exercises and sure enough, I started playing worse. So there's clearly something there. And it was just fascinating to me to hear the extent to which some people would do it. I mean, that's also a lot of work to like wake up early and go sit, you know, on the lawn and stare at the, the you know, the leaderboard and picture something there. You could argue that's work the same way hitting balls at the range is work. And so some people just won't do it or don't think maybe it's as important. But for Gary Player, that was as important as spending an hour on the putting green. So I just think that's, I think, find that kind of fascinating. Have you dreamt about the day or the year where you can measure that? Well, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting things to measure about um, mindset that we're probably still very early to a lot of whoop was founded on this notion that uh, feelings are overrated. And another way to say that is that there's things your mind's telling yourself that are different from what's going on in your body. So obviously there's a mind body connection, but there's also a mind body disconnect, mm. right? What's an example of a mind body disconnect? Well, overtraining, right? That, that's what I experienced where my mind told me to keep going. I'm fine. And my body kept going, but sure enough, it kind of ran itself down. Right. Whereas if I had been measuring that stuff, it would have been clear that I was redlining mm. COVID another fascinating example, right? You can feel fine, but you're carrying a virus. It turns out that if you give to someone else, who's maybe your grandmother, it's not going to be fine for her. So I think that also started to change how people, you know, culturally feel about how much do I know my body? And whoop, we believe there's secrets that are going on inside your body that you can't know without measuring. And I bring that up because I think there's aspects to that with the mind as well that are just from a technology standpoint, we're further away from measuring. Yeah. Did you ever see that? Um Black Mirror episode, The Grain. Yeah. Where he's got the thing that replays all the memories. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's like Whoop 2040. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'll i stay away from the Black Mirror analogy to Whoop. Because well, I mean, the problem with Black Mirror, and it's a little bit of a problem with a lot of sci-fi tech stuff, is it does tend to paint the negative potential. Well, yeah, that's what we pay attention to on the news and everything, right? Is we we want to hear the thing that's like, ugh. Yeah, and but at the same time, you know, we're building a product and a technology that has definitively changed people's behavior and improved their lives. 
totally agree. You know, we very intentionally have not had push notifications on the on on a screen on your wrist or an alarm that goes off or um, we've wanted it to be passive. We wanted to take the tech out of it in a way so that you can still get the benefits from it. So that's where I'm coming from when I say I reject the notion that all sci-fi and like futuristic tech stuff should present tech as potentially being negative. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I I think interesting observation is we spent, I don't know, seven hours together. Yeah. I think I probably saw you on your phone probably for about four minutes maybe. And two of those were like filming swings. Yeah. What are you doing? Who, how, how aren't you texting a bunch of people saying, I'm sorry, or I'll be there, or I hope you're okay, or I can help? How do you, you really just disconnect? When I play golf, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't want my phone anywhere near me. Maybe take some photos, but yeah. other than that, no. I mean, vacation for me is the amount of time I go from looking at my phone. Okay. It's like, you know, probably meditating, exercise, golf, sleep. Those are the easiest times for me to not be looking at my phone. Yeah. And I sort of cherish that because when I'm on my phone or I'm in a work environment, I'm in it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Then you don't have time to do the other stuff, the personal stuff that like enjoys yeah. the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting about Whoop actually is like the whole goal of it is to be in the, in the present with whatever you're doing in the best way possible. And so it would be really nice to, it, it is really nice that it's designed to not pull you out. It's not an app that's like, you know, there's a lot of apps that like they want you to be looking at it a lot. Yeah. And and we you, very strategically didn't make that the focus of Whoop, you know? I mean, think about the fact that it doesn't have a screen on it. Yeah. Yeah. You really only want me to look at the app twice a day for about a minute or two. And then I'm like, cool, I'm good. I know what I need to know. Well, we want you to look at the app when you're ready to check in with the information. Yeah. Now you can spend hours in there. You can spend minutes in there, but yeah. hopefully you're going to come away with some deeper level of awareness. I would love to see my own app usage. Cause I'll bet like once a month, I'm kind of like, all right, let's do a little, let's do a little deep dive. Let's yeah. see where we're at. Every day it's kind of just like, okay, cool. We're good. We're good. Everything's like, you know, it's kind of like flying a plane, you know? Yeah. And fortunately by virtue of people wearing this 24 seven, you know, we don't have to worry about them engaging with the product. Right. Cause the pro yeah, the product is engaging with their body, not their mind. Yeah. Well, the, the, or just naturally, if you wear something 24 seven, chances are you're going to look at why. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're going to wind down here. Do you, before I ask you a couple of quick questions, do you have any questions for me? What's the biggest benefit you've gotten from your whoop? Oh, geez. I mean, well, what it gives me is a, is a game. It, it gamifies my own, uh, like physiological activities. Right. And it allows me to see like, oh, I'm maximum here or like, oh, wow. Today, like, cause I, like I said, I'm not, I don't characterize myself as an athlete. I love health. You know, I have a sauna, I have an ice bath, I have a Peloton, I have a tonal and I have an eight sleep. Like I'm all into this shit. You're in it. Yeah. Like I love it. But like, <laughs> I also like, also just kind of like, don't really need it too badly. But like for me, the whoop allows me to like, it's a game for me. Is that, does that, does that make sense? Well, if we can gamify making you healthier, that's a good thing. Exactly. And that's what I need because I need a game to get me to go walk in a park without my phone for four hours. I need a game to help me. And the game of photography and filmmaking allows me to come here and talk to you. And the game of talking to someone about my business allows me to connect with someone about I have a problem. So it really is all just a game for me. And so the whoop really applies to that because it's a game that I play with myself, just like golf. Whoa. There you go. So tied it all together. My, my, my last couple of questions for you is like really like the, um, you talked about Charlie Rose, but do you know uh, Inside the Actor Studio? I've heard of that. Where he does the Proust questionnaire? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. What do you hate? What do I hate? Yeah. Uh, laziness. Lack of follow through. Flakiness. Those are things that bug me. Same. Uh, what do you love? My wife. Building this company. Seeing people get healthier. Um, 
how do you want to die? Happy. <laughs> or wait, no, that's not the real question. The question is, how do you think you will die? Is the same answer or no? Uh, yeah, I think I'll die happy. I think I, I, I don't think a lot about death, and I'm not looking forward really? to dying. I feel like most people who really do a lot with their life think about death a lot. Well, I don't think about death in the sense that I don't I don't see it in my future, so but, to speak. I guess what I'm saying is a most immediate future, if you will. I'd be surprised. I, I would be surprised if you told me that you felt like you had more than enough time to get done what you wanted to get done in your this life. Well, I'm telling myself I can get it done in this life. <laughs> okay. So you might be right and I might be right. There's a world where both can be true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Will. I really appreciate the talk. Yeah, this has been great. Thanks, Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Did I miss anything? We're good. That was fun, man. <laughs>